Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains that's in Missouri in the USA. Today we're going to talk about repairing hybrids. No, not that type of hybrid, this type of hybrid. A hybrid module is a small electronic circuit that's on its own circuit board with some pins coming out of it, and you could think of it as a macro component. It's got a bunch of small components on one circuit board that is then soldered to a larger circuit board. So perhaps the designer needed to do this to save some space uh, because they couldn't fit everything on the board or they needed the parts in a different orientation or maybe they just needed the parts all on their own board all at the same temperature. At any rate, uh, what they do is they put all these parts on the board. It has some pins coming off of it and they usually coat that whole thing in epoxy to protect it. So you might remember a few weeks ago when I was trying to recover some basic programs off of these program modules for the Sharp PC-1500 Radio Shack PC-2. I found what looked like a cut jumper on this guy and I soldered it together, which turned out to be a bad thing because it shorted out the 4.7 volt supply and burned up the voltage regulator hybrid in this guy. So that got me wondering, um, can that be repaired? So I set off on a journey to find out if that's something that an average person could do at home. So let's have a look at the process and see how it worked. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. They offer an excellent quick turn PCB prototyping service, which now has a free upgrade to the 150 160 temperature range. They also offer a wide range of services that allow you to go from idea to a finished product, including CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, PCB assembly, Go on over to pcbway.com slash OEM to find out more. So this is the little voltage regulator module that I burn up. You might just be able to see all those bumps on the package. That's all the transistors and uh, maybe some resistors and other diodes. They're on the circuit board. It's all assembled with the pins and dipped in some type of epoxy goop. And it's supposed to sit right in there like that. And fortunately, they did include the schematic of what's on this guy in the technical manual along with part numbers of all the transistors and stuff. Uh, we don't have values on all these resistors, but hopefully that will be easier to figure out. So I thought, uh, given I damaged this by overcurrent, probably one of these two transistors is most likely to go bad. This is a Darlington pair here. This is going to handle the most current. It's got a tap here and a tap here. And I thought, well, maybe the component tester, uh, can test these guys. So it's worth a shot anyhow. Okay, so I thought we would start out by testing this 2SB779 right there in the middle. So we can get to that. There are pins 8, 9, and 13. I've got that hooked up. We press the go button on the tester. It tells us it's a PNP transistor. So that works out fine. And I've done all of these already, of course. Um, I'm going to check this Darlington pair now, which is 12, 13, and 14. Just all three here on this end. Using the uh, logic analyzer type clips here. They work out well with the pins this closely spaced. There we go. 14, 13, and 12. Press the go button. And it says it's a diode, which I didn't think was right, but I didn't know how this cheap little tester would deal with a Darlington pair, although it should test it just fine. 
So, now I thought, well, let's compare it to a known working voltage regulator module. Here is one I prepared earlier. Just like one of those cooking shows. I'll press the go button. And you see it showing it as a couple of diodes. So it's not quite sure it's a transistor, but it sees both junctions in there. So I would say that Darlington pair definitely has an issue on the module I burn up. And the next question comes, how is it possible to repair that or is it possible? So this type of coating is some sort of an epoxy um, and I wasn't sure what might dissolve it or loosen it or whatever and I didn't want to experiment on this module. So I tried some tantalum capacitors which have a very similar coating. When I tried heat, of course I just burn up the inside of the capacitor. That wasn't a very good solution. Uh, I tried a dilute sulfuric acid. That didn't do anything. Citric acid didn't do anything. Alcohol didn't do anything. Acetone didn't do anything. And then I tried some uh, Jasco paint and epoxy remover on a tantalum capacitor. And you can see it did effectively strip the coating off of here. It doesn't melt it. It makes it soft and crumbly. And you can break off. This took about three hours to get to the point where I could ship all the stuff off this capacitor. So um, I'm thinking that's what we'll do now with this module and see if we can't get down to the circuit board. I was afraid that by the time the epoxy coating got off there, it would eat into the epoxy circuit board. I stuck a circuit board in the stuff. And you can see down in this corner how it looks a little rougher in the surface finish. That's after about 45 minute exposure to the uh, paint and epoxy remover. Uh, a few people on Twitter guessed this might have a ceramic substrate instead of a fiberglass one. And that could be. It's quite thin. It feels quite stiff. Um, so we'll see what happens. I figure it's going to take two to three hours to strip all this off of there. So I'll get to set up and then we'll have a look at it. This is the stuff I'm using right here. Jasco Premium Paint and Epoxy Remover. Well, this is kind of a, a thick consistency to start with. And I think I've had this can for several years. Um, this may be a little thicker than it is. This container is PETE plastic. It's like what some microwave food comes in. And this stuff is remarkably chemical resistant. Uh, if left overnight, it will start attacking the plastic. So you can't store it in here indefinitely. And then I'm just going to slip our module in here. And I'll check it after, say, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and then probably every hour okay after one hour there were a few little chips in the stripping goop and get a hold of this little guy with some pliers here there is definitely some stripping action going on uh, can see a little bit of the something shiny under here. It's working much faster on this than it did on the uh, tantal of capacitor. Oh yeah, look at that. I'm not really pressing down with a screwdriver. I'm just sliding it across the surface. Okay, this is after two hours in the goop. Um, when I scooped off as much of the goop off of this as I could before taking it out of the container. A lot of this red stuff schluffed off of there. Oh yeah, now it's coming off in, in big chunks. Again, not really trying to scrape the screwdriver against the board. I'm just trying to use it to slide the 
red epoxy coating off of there. This side with the components on it is definitely trickier. Try this little brass brush now. I think it'll be soft enough not to damage anything on the board, but it might encourage some more of the red stuff to come off of there. Well, here is our naked hybrid module. You can see it cleaned up pretty well, about three hours total in soaking time. We've got our transistors here. This one is actually a diode in a SOT23 package. Uh, these rectangles with all the green coating on it, these are all carbon printed resistors. So you can see these all here. And, you know, uh, physically and mechanically, this looks okay. These pins are actually just soldered there. And then it has this other leg that's just folded over to the back of the board. This is a single-sided ceramic substrate. So these are actually pretty weak. I think uh, knowing this, I would have uh, soldered this to a scrap piece of perf board just to kind of hold all the pins in place and strengthen them a little bit. But no, uh, it did get cleaned up well. I took a picture of this, printed it out on large scale, uh, arbitrarily marked part designations on here, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, etc. Figured out this one was a diode, so I marked it with a D, labeled the resistors, capacitors, and then looked at the schematic and that way I labeled the schematic to match the picture, measured the resistors to find out all the resistances. And the only thing I found that was noticeably different was here on pin six uh, that is supposed to go directly to the gate of Q5. Um, this is Q5 here. This is pin six, but we can see it comes up and it goes through a resistor and then over to the gate of Q5. Uh, in total, this resistor is about 163K, so about 81K on each side. So it is like here, instead of just having an uh, 160K resistor here, there's 81K on each side of this uh, tap here, which goes down to the the gate on this transistor. So maybe the, that was a change. They used a different size, different uh, pot value here. I do not know uh, when that change was made or if there's different versions of this board. Maybe that increased the adjustability or something like that. But this resistor this 2SB710 is the one that's bad. And I was able to cross-reference that um, to something else. These are a little hard to get now. It's basically like a surface mount version of a um, 3906 transistor, a very common PNP transistor, a little higher uh, current version. I believe the part number I was able to cross it to is an MM3314. Uh, so those were pretty cheap on eBay. Like 20 of them for a couple bucks shipped. So hopefully that'll get our little module here fixed up. Uh, we should have those in a few days and we can try uh, removing this transistor and soldering a new one on. Uh, ceramic substrates are a little tricky because they really suck the heat away. So I'll probably preheat this on a hot plate, uh, you know, cover everything but this in Captan tape, preheat it on a hot plate, and then take the hot air gun just to this guy. And do the same thing when I go to solder the new transistor on, preheat it on the hot plate, and then solder the transistor on. And then they list the um, adjustment method down here to get everything just right. And I'm going to have to figure out a way to recoat this board because that coating actually provides a lot of the strength for these pins. So 
to look into some conformal coding or something like that. A bit of handheld shaky cam here. I wanted to show you the setup and then we'll try to record through the document camera here. Or I've got the module set up. I've got two handles connected to the pace station right now. Soldering iron handle with a curved surface mount tip and a tweezer handle. Displaying the document camera up here so I've got a nice large view of the uh, module and the rest of the desk is filled with miscellaneous crap. Let's see now if we can swap out that bad transistor. I straightened up the leads on the module as best I could and I stuck them in this pin header to help hold them straight and protect them. And then I took some of this acrylic PCB sealant that I normally use for trace repairs and I painted on the back of the pins where they're just kind of pressed against the board just to kind of hold them there and keep them in place. It seemed like it did a pretty good job. You can see it looks like this capacitor has been reworked. I pulled that off the board so I can measure the value and write that on my updated schematic. Now over here on this other corner is the transistor that we need to replace. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that guy. Yep, that's the guy there, the one on the top left. So we'll need to get him pulled off the circuit board. So first I'll apply a little rosin paste flux with a Q-tip. That'll do. Then I'm going to use a soldering iron with a medium chisel tip to preheat all the joints. Let's just get some heat in the board, make sure the solder reflows easily. And getting all the heat in the board is kind of helpful on this ceramic substrate. There we go. Everything's flowing nice. And we've got the board preheated. Now we will bring in the tweezer iron. Try to keep my hand out of the way. And even though it's made for different types of packages, it works pretty well for these SOT23s. Get it positioned so we can kind of heat everything up. And, oh, must try again. There we go. We're getting there. Oh, nope, missed it again. There we go. Got the thing off of there. Now we'll use a little solder braid to clean up those pads. Again, I'm just using a uh, regular soldering iron tip here. And I'm trying to be gentle of that green stuff that's under there, which is a coating over the traces. And this takes a little longer to heat up because that ceramic substrate just loves to draw all the heat away. And we'll clean up all that old flux with a Q-tip with some alcohol on it. Make it squeaky clean. If we take a look at the bottom of that transistor, we can see a little dimple there uh, where the package has got too hot and it's expanded. This part is definitely bad. I put some fresh paste flux down and we'll get that transistor kind of positioned on there. There we go, finally got it. And I've got a curved surface mount tip on the iron and I'll just get one corner of that part tacked on there or I'll try to get a little more solder on that tip. And there we go, okay. Yeah, you can see the heat soaking through the board and working its way across there. Got leg number two. And there we go. And I'll get the third leg. Now we've got it all soldered on there once again. I wanted to test this repaired uh, hybrid module before uh, trying to re-encapsulate it and popping it back into the computer. So I whipped up this little circuit on a breadboard based on the schematic in the manual. Um, I did include the output voltage adjustment pot, but not the one for the display since I have no display connected. I just put resistors in there to simulate the pot. 
So not everything is exactly, there's no uh, thermistor in here. I just put a fixed resistor in there. So I will zoom out here so we can see the meter. And I'm gonna turn power on and I'm measuring to start with here at VGG, which has power output all the time. When you turn the computer on, it grounds pin nine right here, which turns on VCC. So we've got power on. I'm outputting six volts. And you can see we have about 4.7 volts out, which is what it says there should be. I'm measuring at VGG though. If I measure at VCC, which is after the extra transistor to turn on the output when we're in power on mode. See now I have zero if I ground that input. It's showing four volts. So we've got about a 0.7 volt drop which is the um, drop across the transistor even though this says VGG and VCC so both be 4.7. I do not think that's accurate. I imagine you're supposed to adjust the pot to get VCC at 4.7. Um, I don't know though. So what I will do is uh, measure this on a working unit to see what those voltages actually are. But I'm pretty happy that uh, this is working. Um, I still want to test it completely with all the real parts. So I might solder this little single row header I have into the computer and plug it in and test it and then if everything works fine if i can adjust the voltages and everything uh, then i will get some epoxy and encapsulate it i soldered a header into the pocket computer and plugged in the repaired voltage regulator module and it worked fine i was able to adjust the voltage the computer worked so now need to figure out how to re-encapsulate this module. Not quite sure how to do that. Well, how did the encapsulation go? I would say in general, okay, but not perfect. Uh, I made up a number of sample boards to test different things out. I got this epoxy here shown beside the scale I use for measuring things. It's intended as an electronics potting epoxy with good thermal conductivity etc. Um, it may not have been the perfect choice for this application. It is designed to cure very slowly so it gives all the bubbles time to rise to the surface so you don't need a vacuum pump. Um, that made it a little more difficult to deal with. Uh, the my first try, let me zoom in here. My first try was this board where I soldered my sample board to a carrier and put a little handle on it. Um, this kind of dripped. It was okay. It would have done the job holding the parts on, and you know, the main thing was holding the the pins on because they're not very well secured to the ceramic board. Um, but it was hard to see like this, dipping it into the cup of epoxy, how deep it was, and I wound up epoxying it to the carrier board, which is you know less than ideal. Uh, then I went to using a uh, wire soldered onto the pins like this. That was much better. I made this board, which is probably the best cosmetically, although at this thickness, this epoxy was translucent, uh, but it coated well. I wound up having to use a um, hot plate and hang this over a coffee cup. I'll poke a picture in here. To help it cure faster and then I could dip it back in the same cup which was not near the hot plate and it was still thinner. Uh, that worked okay and it's a fairly nice smooth bubble free coating that you know leached up to the pins what held them in place. That was fine. I tried putting some tape over the pins and uh, to protect it but if you get any liquid leaking up there you just glue the tape to the pin so yeah that was not a good idea and then somebody gave me the tip of adding 
uh, acrylic paint to the epoxy. They said they use 15 minute epoxy and add a few drops of acrylic paint. It dyes the or tints the epoxy well, but it takes the 15 minute epoxy down to about a five minute epoxy. It causes it to cure very fast. Uh, this was my first trial on that and it worked okay. I waited a little too long to dip it and it was too thick but it formed over the pins and held everything in place and it's okay. And I thought, well, okay, on my second try of this, I probably will do a good job. So I used the real part and came up with this. As you can see, it's a little ugly. Um, it did kind of crawl up over the pins here. So it'll do its primary job of holding the pins mechanically in place, uh, which is really what I was after. Uh, so this went from taking more than an hour to set up. I added about 10% of black acrylic paint to it, which took the working time down to about 15 minutes. So I waited a little too long again on this before dipping it. So it came out rough and bumpy and bubbly, but mechanically okay. It's just a little ugly. I think um, if I would have dipped it just about two or three minutes sooner and just rotated it by hand around to keep it you know moving and not settling in one place that would have done the job but now we have a working part that is re-encapsulated and mechanically sound we can reinstall that back into the pocket computer and adjust the voltage according to the manual while I had this apart I desoldered this rear cover so I could put a little citric acid on the battery contacts which had just a little bit of corrosion on there and I dried it and wiped it down with alcohol so I'll set that aside to finish drying um, and there's one other thing I want to point out here when I first took this apart I noticed these three diodes in here and I thought you know one of these does not look like the others why do we have these two little glass ones and this one a big black plastic one and then it occurred to me that about a year ago uh, I had the same unit die I was messing with connecting an external EEPROM to it to run code from the EEPROM and I thought well maybe it was something I did but I also found a loose screw inside I'll poke a picture in here and what I found then is that this diode was bad that diode in question is this guy. It's a 1SS98. And we can see these other two diodes, which are these guys. So at the time, I looked up the data sheet for a 1SS98, and I found out that it was a Schottky diode, meaning it has about a 0.3 volt uh, forward drop, which is important here because we only have four AA batteries. We don't want a lot of voltage drop going to our voltage regulator and this was put in here for some reverse polarity protection so if you accidentally put the batteries in backwards you're not going to blow the computer up and at the time i looked around on my junk box and this guy was the only shot key diode i had and i thought well all that's important is that forward voltage drop so i went ahead and soldered him in there and it worked fine you know a year later i accidentally short out the five volt supply on the module and I burn up the transistor on the voltage regulator, which is this guy right here. Well, that made me think about this diode. So I went back and carefully looked at the data sheet for this diode, and I found out that it has a current limit of 50 milliamps. This transistor has a current limit of 500 milliamps. So not only does this diode act like uh, a reverse polarity protection, but it's also going to act like a fuse if you short out your 5 volts output or 4.7 volts of this voltage regulator. And, you know, the diode I put in here, this, this giant thing probably has a 1 amp or so uh, current rating. So it had no problem, but we overloaded this little transistor here which had a 0.5 amp rating and it blew 
and the diode was fine. So I looked around for modern equivalents with this same 50 milliamp rating and I found a few surface mount parts that would work, but they are absolutely tiny. It would have been very difficult to use. And I finally found some 1SS98 diodes on AliExpress. There's a few on eBay, but they wanted ridiculous prices, like $12 a piece for them. So I bought 20 of these from you know, AliExpress for about the same price. I've got one bent to the right shape to solder across here, so I'm going to go ahead and replace that and we'll reattach the, the uh, battery wires and solder in the voltage regulator. I did go ahead just for fun and I put a pin one dot on our re-encapsulated voltage regulator. Uh, I had to use yellow paint because I didn't have any white. Anyhow, I'll get this all set up and then we will adjust the voltages. Okay, our testing condition, it is turned on. I've got seven volts applied here. Uh, the module is about 25C, as the directions say, and it says for adjusting VCC, we should monitor pin eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we should have 4.7 plus or minus 20 thousandths. Oh, that is darn close, because we're about 4.68 plus or minus 20 thousandths. Yeah, okay, we're good to go there. And VR2 to adjust V display, which is pin 4 to 3.7. 1, 2, 3, 4. That should be 4.7. We've got 0.9. What does the display look like? The display looks okay. Okay. Pin four. Pin one is one point eight. Pin two, two point eight. Pin three, three point eight. Pin four point nine. Okay, um I think there might be a mistake in the manual here because pin four is right at the bottom of a voltage divider. See pin four is here, this is our V display. It's at the bottom of the voltage divider. Uh, it's connected to ground through this transistor Q5. And, you know, we have about 3.8 volts here, and it goes down as we get to here, which is what it should do. So there's no way we can have 3.7 volts here. That doesn't make any sense. So since our VCC did not change, I'm guessing our V display didn't change. But I do not know. So unless I find any more information about this in another part of the manual, I am going to say that it's saying to adjust V display to 3.7 is wrong. Maybe this should have been V. Maybe V display should have been here at pin 3. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to me. But as you can see. Eh, rotate, rotate. You can see the display is working and it looks fine. Oh, I'm looking at it upside down, but yep, that is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, when looked at head on, it's nice and dark. So, our voltage regulator module repair is successful. And if I find any more information about uh, this V display adjustment, I will cut it in here. Well, how about that? It is possible to repair hybrid modules at home without a lot of fancy equipment or really nasty chemicals. Uh, as you can see, the PC2 is working again, and it was kind of fun learning how to do that. Now, figuring out how to tint the epoxy and, and things like that, that was just, you know, done for fun, a little icing on the cake, so to speak. Uh, I could have done it and left the epoxy, you know, semi-translucent, that would have been fine. 
The only reason I needed to coat it in epoxy was to hold the pins in place because they were only soldered on one side of that circuit board. I did look in the service manual for more information about that uh, V display adjustment and there wasn't any and I, I really think that's a misprint because there's no way that voltage is supposed to be 3.7 volts. That just doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm not sure what it should be. It, it was about 0.9 on uh, this PC2. And I vaguely remember a conversation with somebody on the Sharp group on Facebook from a couple years ago that had a dead one of these. And he had measured the voltages on that. And I think he had around 0.9 on the V display there because we were both thinking that indicated a problem on the voltage regulator, but that may not have been it. That might be perfectly normal. This is the only one I've ever measured. Now, if you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Just leave them in that comment section that is down there below. And thanks to everyone who helped support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated. And until next time, bye.